calm, focused happiness. Welcome once again to Mindfulness Mode, and I'm Bruce Langford. Very, very pleased to tell you that I'm here today with an award-winning author, and she's a former tech industry leader, empowering women with tried and tested strategies. She's all about mindfulness and energetic practices, and... Uh, works to help her clients increase their impact and influence. And her work has been featured in Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, and Thrive Global. She has three books, a series of three books, which we'll be talking about. She does keynotes. She does uh, podcasting work. And uh, wow, she's really putting her message out there in the community. So I'm very excited and happy to tell you that today I'm with JJ DiGeronimo. JJ, great to have you here. Are you in mindfulness mode today? Hi, I'm in mindfulness mode this afternoon. I can't say I was in it this morning when I was running around getting things done, but I'm here now. Before we got together, I really just gave myself a few minutes to just really get into the moment. So I'm so happy to be here with you, Bruce. Fantastic. So JJ, what does mindfulness mean to you? Yes. Yeah, so mindfulness to me is really the practice of recognizing that there are many things happening around you, including your inner voice, that, that ego talking in your head. And I don't think before I really took mindfulness training, I understood that I could create separation between that ego mind or monkey mind. People will often say. And I think for mindfulness for me is being aware of what is happening inside and outside. Right. Well, it's really cool that you've written three books. They're a series. Let's start with the most recent book that you've written. It's uh, it's a very interesting book called Seeking. Let's uh, let's talk about your book. What brought you to the point where you, you wrote this particular book and wanted to put mm. these messages out to the world? Well, I will say before I get into the actual book, you know, writing a book is not easy and the industry is getting more and more saturated with authors, which is a good and bad thing. So, you know, I already had a couple of books that I really wanted to get this book specifically published by a spiritual publishing company. And I worked really hard at working on the book proposal. And when I pitched the book, it happened to happen right as we were coming out of the, um, well, actually in the middle of the pandemic. And then there was a huge diversity play. And so I got six no's for the book to get it published to the six houses I wanted to, which was surprising because I had done pretty well in my last two books. But I just, I think me as a tech businesswoman moving into the spiritual space was like, wait a minute, we don't know if you know what you're talking about. But in reality, off the side of my desk, I've been doing spiritual seeking my whole life. And really since 2016, I've turned the volume up because I got to a place in my career and in my life that. I thought I was going to feel so differently about my life. I had so many of the accolades I had been striving for most of my career. Many of those came to fruition, but I still had this very empty feeling. And uh, for any of you that do any astrology or, or uh, tarot cards, I had a couple tower moments in my life that really kind of left me just sitting there looking around thinking that this cannot be it. This cannot be it. So I turned to many energy practitioners to really help me dig through my stories and my energy and get rid of some of that darkness and really kind of illuminate more of who I am supposed to be, kind of illuminate more of kind of why I'm here. And my third book is the story of what I did off the side of my desk that helped me illuminate my path forward and give me more confidence that those whispers I were hearing was really that inner voice that guides so many of us. Right. Well, I want to start with negative self-talk. That is something that a lot of my listeners uh, email me about and share with me that, hey, I'm really, really drowning in this. What's your advice? How do we get through this when we have negative thoughts and self-talk? Mm, well, I will tell you, it's a sub part of the subtitle of the book. So Seeking, I have 74 key findings to sidestep your self-doubt, raise your energy, and align with your life's work. And I will tell you that those are in very specific order. When you, self-doubt is, we all have self-doubt. All of us, regardless of what level we're at, we have self-doubt. And social media um, often shows us like who people are sometimes because the posts and the things they do, it's kind of becomes, oh, I see kind of who they are. But I will tell you that when you are 
wanting to do something different, or you hear a whisper inside and you want to maybe try something out, oftentimes our immediate response to doing something new is that voice that says, "Mm, not now, you're not ready. How would you possibly do this? Right? You're not the right person. You're going to fail. You're going to look ridiculous. You don't have any money. Who do you think you are? I mean, all of us have this voice that we admit or not admit, but many of us pay attention to it way too closely. And it often impacts our decisions and actions. And so I had to figure out how to understand that voice and how to sidestep it because you ultimately can't get rid of it. But with mindfulness, mindfulness training, I took uh, 12 weeks of John Kabat-Zinn training uh, at uh, at a local hospital that was offering it uh, as part of their wellness center. And it really gave me the tools to just be able to observe that voice in my head and gave me space to say, you know, am I going to listen to that voice or am I going to step around that voice? Right. Well, I'm really interested in that training that you did. How long ago was that? And what was that experience like for you? Well, if I have to be totally honest, I am a A++ personality. So I had to start the training three times okay. because I did not, like I went to the training with a notebook, coffee, my phone, my to-do list. And I was there just to kind of listen and learn. And every time we would have an exercise, I'd open my notebook and I'd write things down. And my teacher was like, um, w- what is the notebook for? And I'm like, well, in case I get a good thought, she's like, uh, yeah, you, you need to leave the notebook in the car. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not leaving the notebook in the car because if I have a good thought, I'm going to write it down. And she's like, yeah, that's not what this is about. You actually have to be an observer of your thoughts without hanging on to any one thought. And I'm like, well, that is ridiculous. Why would I possibly do that? And she was like, you know, maybe this isn't the class for you. So I took a break and I started again and I got a little bit farther. And then the third time is when I really was like emotionally ready to lean into the learnings. It took me a while. I, I, it's not surprising that people don't live mindful lives because it is hard to just slow yourself down enough to even learn the practices. Yeah, totally. Well, that's such an interesting story. Wow. And then once you got in there for the third time, how different was that for you once you were able to let go and just leave the notebook at home? It was mind blowing because I really gave myself the space to, and I'll say I had kids. So it was Sunday and I just felt like I should have been at home. I had all this guilt associated with going too. So it wasn't just my inability to lean in. I had so much guilt of just being there. And I think sometimes especially as women, when we do stuff for ourselves, that sometimes we just have so much guilt in being there. And I think if you sign up for something, you should just allow yourself to be there. So that was a big lesson for me of just allowing myself to be there and, you know, not work on the grocery list, not plan the next, you know, PTO picnic, school picnic or whatever I had was working on, you know, in addition to my day job. But I will tell you when I was there, And I really gave myself the opportunity. I could not believe how busy I was in my head. I could not believe how much mind chatter I had. I could not believe how negatively I talked to myself. Wow. Wow. And speaking of that, are you a meditator? Have you learned to meditate? And is this something that is part of your life? Yes. So I'm a big, uh, so I listen to a lot of YouTube meditations. I try to do it twice a day, but generally it's once a day. And, you know, I would say I'm a 20 minutes person. I have my favorite uh, YouTube channel is Steve Noble. Okay. Do you listen to him at all? No, I don't. He does a lot of 3D, 4D, 5D, you know, so many different types of meditations. And I love his meditations. And you can literally pick, he's got hundreds and hundreds of them. And you can pick all different types of meditations. So I listen to him a lot. He's probably my favorite. He's my go-to on YouTube. Cool. And so that's interesting. You meditate twice a day. What's your daily routine like? What do you do when you first get up in the morning? Mm, Well, my first choice, like when I pick up my phone, I I go right to YouTube and turn on a meditation before I even look at my emails. That's my, I start with that. And even if it's 11 minutes long, to me, it doesn't matter if it's 11 or 20. I just need to just get into a meditation right when I wake up. And that's only so quick, 11 to 20 minutes, I pick one. And then I'll let myself look at my email. But then I take the dog for a walk 
and I try to just be present, you know, walking, just picking out things that I didn't recognize the day before is kind of like my fun game I play is what can I see that I didn't see yesterday or the 10 days before yesterday. So. And what have you learned from your children about mindfulness? Hmm. Well, I will say, I think my children were a lot more mindful before the age of 10. I think devices have been very impactful in their mindfulness approach to life. I think when your children are younger and you have a lot more, I would say just you're with them a lot more and they're, and they're not so occupied by their friends and their devices. They're so, they notice everything and things I'd done a thousand times and I bring them to do it, you know, like the escalator in the Atlanta airport, right? I had, yeah. I had travel for my living. So I had been on that escalator a hundred thousand times probably. But then when I take my kids to Atlanta, they're like, oh my God look at this yeah. and it just brings a whole new life and memory to those things yeah wow it really does that's cool yeah well I want to ask you about uh, some of the stories that you share in your book you've got short chapters you've got such great relevant stories you're a fantastic storyteller maybe you have a story from your book that you can share with us because it really helps the reader to I don't know, not be able to put that book down. Mm, it's funny. I met with a woman last night that read the book and just left her job after 24 years. And she said, the book has given me permission to lean into what is calling me. So I would say at a high level, I talk about self-doubt is a big thing, right? Self-confidence, relationships that you have and the lessons that, that they're there to teach you, you, how you prioritize and what energy you give money. And then I shift in a lot to the mindfulness and the ego and the soul and the whispers and how do you, you know, raise your frequency or raise your energy. So you tr attract the energy and, and the momentum you need to kind of push yourself forward. So the book is full of nuggets, really, regardless of where you are on your journey. But because I'm a speaker and I do a lot of events, I will tell you that, uh, I had a moment where my confidence walked out the back door. Oh, really? So I was getting ready to speak. I was the second speaker. I had been already speaking for, well, I spoke in my day job, but then I was a professional speaker from 2010. And this was like 2015. So I'd been speaking for a while. And I was the second speaker and I was sitting at the front table waiting to go up. And the woman before me who put the conference together had a lot of her friends in the room. A lot of women from the area knew her. And she took us through an emotional journey of losing her mother. And just all the twists and turns of things that had happened, the emotional struggle she had before her mother passed and after, there was not a dry eye in the room. And so many of the people that were sitting near me were like trying to bring themselves back together. And as they're doing this, I completely lose confidence in what I'm going to talk about. She was so phenomenal that she and her story brought me so much emotion that I second guessed everything that I was going to say. In fact, I started reworking my entire presentation while I was sitting in that seat. And looking back now, I know my confidence got up and walked out the back door. And when they announced my name to come up and speak, I had no idea what I was going to talk about because I couldn't remember what I had put together and I couldn't remember what I just rewrote. And I got up there and I have to say, I don't even know what I said that day. And everyone was super kind, but I know I failed miserably. Because mm -hmm. I, not only did I not trust myself and what I had to say, I robbed everybody in the audience of the gifts that I could have shared with them. And I think so many of us at times second guess who we are and the gifts that we're here to share because we try to be like somebody else. Yeah. Wow. That must have been a, a very, very pivotal experience I would imagine because I've done a lot of speaking myself and I I know what it can feel like if you you have that just before you go up there and you think oh my gosh like what am I gonna say and, and while you've got the whole thing planned 
So, wow. I always ask a question about bullying, JJ, in my uh, show. And I want to ask you if you have a story of any kind that's related to bullying and how mindfulness may have made a difference. Mm. Well, I'll tell you, I've been bullied many times in my life, especially in high school. I feel like there were times I was eating my lunch in the safe in the office because I was the treasurer of my class. And I had this girl particularly that had a really tough go of it. Her mom died at early age. Her dad took other options and she was kind of lost in her journey and was takes, took it out on people. And uh, I used to hide in the safe because I was so afraid of her. Mm. And then one day I just couldn't take the fear and the energy. And just every time I saw her, my body would like freeze. And one day after months and months of being scared to death, I was like, that's it. I've had it. I don't care if I end up in the hospital, but this is going to end today. Like I am done with this energy. Because if you think of a time where you're so fearful and you've been bullied, it's like you tense up like this and you just like, it's like you become someone you're not. It's like you're running without really running. Right. And it's funny because most bullies I've learned now are kind of weak. And that's one of their MOs is they try to be the loudest and most boisterous and downright rude at times. But honestly, they're the weakest of the souls and oftentimes they're feeling very sick and lonely inside. But when I approached her, I was praying for my life and I just went up to her. I'm like, this is it. Today's the day we're going down. You and me, one of us is ending up in the hospital and I'm not quitting until that happens, you know? And I think because I hit it so head on, I scared the crap out of her. Sounds like you might have. <laughs> and I, but I was so sick of being scared that yeah. I was like, no more, no more. I'm not going to let somebody else like really adjust or impact my energy that much. And I was in high school. She has since come back just over a decade ago and sent me a message in Facebook apologizing, telling about she must have been going through a program and apologized. And we have since uh, become friends and I've sent her several books, mine and others that I like that inspire me. And uh, we have been able to foster a great like virtual relationship because we live in different towns. Wow. What a great story. That is, that is really, really cool. I was going to ask you if you had any stories from childhood. I was thinking of like when you were younger that may have foreshadowed the kind of work you ended up doing. Well, sure. I mean, I think we all get glimpses of our life's work early on in our lives. We don't really recognize or see it. But, you know, my parents, my mom specifically, and my aunts would take me to Lilydale, which you may have heard of. Lilydale is just outside. Oh, you would love it. Lilydale is just outside Buffalo, New York, around Jamestown. Okay. And it's um, it's a spiritual community that's open for the summer where mediums and psychics and readers spend their summers and you can walk around and they have all these stump talks and you can visit people in their homes and they'll have readings for you. And they started taking me there when I was 10, 11, 12. Little did I know that I would spend so much of my life now with light workers and energy practitioners uh, as part of the work that I'm doing. Right. That's interesting. Uh, JJ, uh, you have a website that uh, I find intriguing. And the website is, and I'm just scrolling through here to see what that website was. And I kind of, uh, I'm just taking- Oh, I bet you're on, it. I know you're on togetherweseek.online. Yes, togetherweseek.online. Yeah, tell us what we can find when we go to that website. So I would say since 2016, I have reactivated my seeking. So finding out who I am, why I'm on the planet right now, what is the work I'm here to do? And frankly, I couldn't do that by myself. I have met with a series of energy practitioners uh, that do tapping and uh, past life regression, astrology, astrophotography, um, just a QHHT, like a ton of different types of practices. And I have met with so many amazing women and men that have given me the ability to dig deep, you know, sidestep that guilt, sidestep that self-doubt and really align with the energy and light from within. And I just couldn't do it alone. And so I've had many people ask me, well, who do you go to for this? Or who do you go to for that? And last year I started Together We Seek Dot Online as a way 
to interview many of the energy practitioners I work with so that you can get to know them, understand their journey, understand the gifts that they're offering the world, and connect with them directly. And you can do all of this inside Together We Seek Dad online. And I share that across all my social platforms of the work that I'm doing because I feel like we all need to lean on each other at this time to really not only balance the feminine masculine energy, because we're pretty lopsided right now, but we need to do that to raise the frequency of the planet so that we can all live with more light and love. I'm glad you mentioned about the feminine and masculine. I know you uh, mostly work with women, maybe completely work with women. Did you ever work with men? And tell us, why do you only work with women? That's a beautiful question. So as you know, I'm, I have a computer uh, degree and I've spent 20 years in technology where I was often the only woman. Uh, and I had to really lean heavily on my masculine energy. Most of us, all of us have feminine and masculine energy, but when you're in a STEM-based career, a lot of times you have to really lean on that masculine energy. And through that, I just recognize so much that the world needs more feminine energy. They need more feminine energy. So many products are designed mostly by men. Uh, so many things that are happening in the world are being led by men. And I feel like the world needs more feminine energy. And it's going to be really hard to squeak that out of men. We can, but it's going to be a little bit easier for us to kind of get more women to come to the table and share and be collaborative and be creative and look at things a different way. And so with that of trying to really harmonize more of a collaboration nature, I felt like it made sense to empower more women to take more seats at the table. Yeah, that makes sense. Can you give us an example of the type of woman you work with and the kind of journey you take them on? Well, it's interesting because I do mostly one to many. I'm not really, I don't do any individual coaching. Mm -hmm. I Oftentimes women come to me when they're burned out, depleted, overcommitted, really just kind of sick and tired of their life. Uh, and they're like, you know, I just need to do something different. So I do host retreats for women, but I also meet them a lot of times online in group settings where I'm connecting them to energy practitioners that have helped me. And so my real goal is just to be a connector for people to meet more people that can help them on their journey. And I work with a lot of light workers, And in my opinion, light workers are people that have really worked on clearing out the darkness within themselves to illuminate their light. And when they illuminate their light, they can illuminate it for others. And so gritting these people connected so that we can create more ways for more people to really lean into their whispers. And that's not something we've talked about yet, but it is something that I find is instrumental in really aligning with your life's work. Leaning into their whispers. I want to hear more about that. Yeah. So you probably, I'd be interested in what your whispers are, but I would tell you one or two of mine and I'd love to hear maybe one or two of yours. But, you know, when I was, um, I get whispers, like things that come to me that make no sense when they first come usually. So, and it's usually something that's kind of doesn't have an emotion to it. It's not fear-based. It just kind of says, Hey, you should do this. So for example, in 2016, I was speaking in Seattle and as I was getting off the stage, I heard a little whisper inside saying, bring the women outside. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I can't do that. Like I'm in a conference building. Like I might want to have them follow me outside. So I didn't do anything about it. And I had all these women come up to me at the end. And most of them were doing some kind of energy practice or something, which I didn't even talk about on stage. I just think the frequency of what I was doing in my own personal life attracted those women to me on the side of the stage. But then I heard it again when I was traveling to another conference. And what I recognized is that so many of the events I was speaking at, women were kind of sitting outside their body. They weren't really connected, like really deeply connected within. And so in 2017, a year had gone by, I reached out to an energy practitioner by the name of Dora. And I called her my Dora. I keep getting these messages and I don't know what they mean. I don't know why I keep saying bringing things. And she's like, well, JJ, what do you think they mean? And I'm like, well, been wanting to do these retreats because for myself, I was looking for a retreat for myself and I couldn't really find what I was looking for. Like I really didn't want to do a yoga retreat. I didn't want to do a juicing retreat. I didn't want to do a silent retreat, but I wanted to go somewhere where I felt like I could connect with women and do something enlightening. And she's like, well, tell me what you want to do. So I kind of explained to her and she's like, well, what do you think your message means? And I was like, yeah, 
I'm supposed to create that retreat. I'm supposed to bring the women outside. I'm supposed to create the retreat that I'm looking to build and attend. And I was like, but I'm so nervous. I've never hosted a retreat. They're so expensive. And she's like, JJ, build what you want to go to. And if nobody shows up, it's an investment in yourself. So much to my surprise, yeah, much to my surprise, 12 women showed up. But even as they were walking in the door, my self-doubt was like, kicks in heavy, right? It's like, what are you doing? You're never going to be able to do this. These women are going to be disappointed. They're going to think they paid too much, you know? And it's just funny because even on the day when everyone's registering and they're coming in, I'm still really wrestling that voice inside that's constantly trying to scare the crap out of me. Yeah. Wow. That's a great story. And now you do retreats on a regular basis. When's your next retreat? Tell us about that. Oh my goodness. So, well, I'm working on a few things. I'm working on a a destination retreat with this woman for Iceland for January. So that'll be exciting. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do the polar plunge. If you've done any research on that and how powerful that can be. I'm having a, a woman's business retreat in August. So that's already filled up and ready to go. And then I'm just going to see, I kind of wait until the universe sort of tells me things three times. I really wait to see what it wants me to work on. I, I used to run around crazy and do all this stuff. And sometimes I've known to do that, but I really kind of wait until it manifests before me. And I'm like, okay, this woman came to me and then I got a, a note in an email about this date. And then this woman came to me about something else. And when I get that triangulation of notification, then I know like that's the next thing I'm supposed to do. Wow. That's, that's awesome. And I didn't mention this, but your website, your other website, jjdgeronimo.com, jjdigeronimo.com. So go there check out the website, check out everything that's coming up. And as we move forward in the the interview, JJ, I want to ask you five quick answer questions. So just 30 second answers are perfect. The first one is this, who is one person who has been a strong influence in your life, a person related to mindfulness? I mean, Oprah, for sure. She's the one that kind of opened my eyes back in the 90s. I'd come Mm -hmm. home and eat ho-hos and watch her four o'clock ABC show after school. And I don't think I missed an episode. Wow. Tell us about uh, emotions and how your emotions have, maybe you've been able to manage your emotions differently or, or see your emotions differently as a result of mindfulness. Well, I definitely recognize and live by this now that everything is happening for you and not to you. And when you go through life thinking things are happening for me, you're like, all right, well, why is that happening right now? Rather than it's happening to me, which is more of a victim mentality. And then you're always like, how dare they? I can't believe that. And now that I live like life is happening for me, I'm like, okay, why is this happening right now? What what is the message? So I think that small shift, life is happening for me rather than to me, has really changed the way I approach everything in my life. Yeah, I can see that. Let's talk about breathing. We haven't really touched on that. Do you have any thoughts, any any certain types of breathing exercises you do or anything like that? I have a lassoing exercise I do. So when I feel like my mind is just getting the best of me and just chewing on a topic, a relationship situation, a work activity, a conversation that is just will not Your mind just will not give it a break. I literally put my fingers on the middle of my forehead and I think about myself lassoing that discussion or conversation or activity. And I lasso it and literally pull it down over the nose, down over the lips, over the chin, down through the neck and onto my heart chakra. And I literally just let that energy move out of my head into my heart. And Sometimes it's a heavy duty topic. So I have to kind of scan back over my head and say, okay, did I get it all? Did I, oh, I found a piece. Okay. And I pull it again down. I can be touching my face or just scanning my skin all the way down to my heart. And so I shift energy around um, visually because I'm more of a visual, but you can also breathe it out too. Like if you just feel like you want to open the top of your head and like blow the air out your mouth and through your head, you can also push energy out of your head too. That's a very interesting exercise. Thanks for sharing that, JJ. I want to ask you about a book that you might recommend. And of course, your book, Seeking, 
74 Key Findings to Raise Your Energy. And you've got two other books in the same series that you'll find on Amazon, Mindful Tribe, when you check that out. Are there any other books that you would recommend related to mindfulness? Oh my gosh, I read all the time. I'm an avid reader. So uh, you can visit me on Goodread for JJ. I think I have 75 books up there. But I guess the one that, I mean, I've been reading Seth Speaks. That's S-E-T-H, Seth Speaks. I've been reading Jane's um, series on that. She's very similar to, um, I was going to say Eckhart Tolle, but no, like uh, Esther Hicks. So she also channels an energy, Jane does. And I like Seth Speaks because it talks a lot about what's happening in the world, even now, even though it was written way back, you know, in the 60s and 70s. Well, we'll put all of that into our show notes at mindfulnessmode.com, Mindful Tribe. And what about an app? Are there any apps that you would recommend that are related to mindfulness? Hmm. You know, I used to use Headspace and I used to use Calm, but honestly, I use YouTube all the time for listening. Like if I just want to change my energy uh, or I just want a quick mindfulness exercise, I will use YouTube. And even if I go and working out for me is a great mind clearer, even mm -hmm. though I don't do it every day, but I love to use YouTube just for exercising too, because it just gets you that extra yucky energy out of your body. And I really think I exercise because I want mind clarity. Right. And didn't you say you listen to Steve Noble on YouTube a lot? Yes. Did you find him? I love uh, him. Well, I uh, I know that you mentioned that he has many, many videos and that you really, really enjoy them a lot. I do. So, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, as we uh, reach the end of our, our interview, I want to ask you if you have any final words of advice for our Mindful Tribe listeners, JJ. I think the one thing that we didn't really touch on that I'd like to highlight is that you attract the energy that you're at. And I always tell people you have to mind your frequency. What do I mean by that? Frequency is a level of energy. So FM radio is frequency modulation. And you could, you know, you could be at 88.2, 94.7, 102.5. It doesn't really matter where you're at, but being mindful of where you are at. Because what I find is I have to pay really close attention to how I talk to myself what I share with other people, what I watch, even what I eat, all of that really impacts how I feel about myself. And if I want to make the impact that I desire, I often have to be at a pretty high frequency. And so I have to be very mindful of how I'm moving through my day, from phone call to phone call, from email to email. And if I'm being snickety or short, like, it takes me a long time to raise my frequency again. And so I really mind what energy frequency I want to sit at in my life. And I make sure I'm adamant about really staying there. So even if people say mean things to me, or if I happen to change lanes and I had somebody in my blind spot and I totally tick them off, I'm always like, so sorry, so sorry. And I also kind of put my hand up because I want to reflect that energy away from me of how angry they are with me because I made a mistake and sometimes we make mistakes and people get really upset with us but like I don't want to take that energy on no. so I feel like you really got to be mindful of the energy you share the energy you listen to the energy you pay attention to and how you treat yourself yeah, good advice. Well, I really appreciate the work you do and how you put all of this out into the world, make it available for people and you help people through your retreats and your writing and and of course your podcasts. We didn't mention your podcasts. One of them is called Together We Seek and the other one is called Career Strategies. So thank you for all this work that you do. And thank you so much for being a guest on Mindfulness Mode, JJ. Oh, thank you, Bruce. And uh, you'll have to send me a note of your whispers too. We have to talk about that at some point. So I'm really excited to be part of this. And thank you for the work that you're doing because everybody listening is not only attracted to your energy, but your message. So that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, thanks so much. Bye now.